Tay Schools. I'm Curtis Grace with the Mobile Police Department. I'm Andy Howard with Mobile County Public School System. Andy, we're going to have a great show. We're going to be talking to Chris Napier, uh, author Chris Napier, about his book, uh, uh, Poverty in Prison, uh, talking about how uh, decisions, life decisions, uh, uh, yield consequences and how to uh, recover from those. I think that's an important conversation. I think our audience can benefit from the dialogue, and I look forward to it. We'll be right back. Rich, Mobile County District Attorney. The failure to obey school bus safety laws will cost you. It can cost you up to a $3,000 fine and the loss of your driving privileges. But more than that, it could cost the life of a child. That's why the Mobile County Public School System is urging you to stop and obey all bus traffic laws. Hi, I'm Pat Mitchell, Director of Transportation for the Mobile County Public School System. We're asking you to obey all bus safety laws. It could save a life. Remember, stop ahead when you see red. Our future depends on it. The Mobile County Public Schools Signature Academies program offers a variety of specialized curriculum for highly interested and motivated students. These academies provide students with choices ranging from aviation to healthcare, advanced information technology to international studies, from engineering to coastal studies. These high quality hands-on programs prepare students for careers readily available in Mobile County. Signature Academies program. Hello and welcome back to Safe Schools. Uh, Chris, uh, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Uh, me. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, Chris, um, I appreciate, we appreciate, first of all, that you came on and wanted to see, speak with us because I think what you got to say is important. But, you know, I, I'm always curious uh, when, I, when I talk to someone to know their story, uh, who they are. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself. You're from this area, from Mobile? Yes, from Pritchard, Alabama. Uh -huh. Growing up in Pritchard, Alabama, which at the time of my birth, Pritchard was the third poorest city in the United States. Growing up in a hostile environment, terrible situation, made poor decisions as a youth. And what led to that was when I was three years old, I, I witnessed the violent and brutal death of my father. Okay. After that, I was misguided received a lot of misinformation on how to grow up to be a man, a young man. Made a terrible decision, quit school when I was 15 years old, encountered the street life, which never took education serious, which eventually, I was constantly suspended or expelled, which eventually led me to being put in jail. When I was 18 years old, I was sentenced to life for first degree murder and just another seven years for distribution of crack cocaine. Inside the Alabama prison system, I experienced culture shock and developed a consciousness that when I was 20 something, I realized that all my friends was in state or federal prison, strung out on drugs or being killed. So at that time, I made a conscious decision to challenge my adverse situation and change my lifestyle. Chris, when did you start writing your book? I wrote the book after being denied for parole. At my second time, after 10 years in prison, I started writing my book. I put all my anger and frustration on paper in case I didn't get out alive, society to see that I'm not the same person I was when I was sentenced to life at the age of 18. And it actually it was therapeutic for me to write this book because it gave me the chance to revisit my life and to redeem myself from the misfortune that I had experienced. You know, your, your, your book is, is empowering in and of itself to people who read the book, everyone that I've talked to who said they enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. You know, one of the things that, that drives home for me is, is the urgency to, to sound the horn or sound the alarm for people who 
are much like you uh, in communities where the black, white, Hispanic, it doesn't matter, but people who are affected by the environmental impact that they live in or yeah. the environment that they live in. What is your advice to young people uh, living through some of the experiences that you live through? That we cannot allow adversity and misfortune and mishap to define our existence. So just because you're born in poverty, it don't mean that you have to stay there. Just because you may experience incarceration or you may be functionally literate, you could take the chance to take it within yourself, the initiative to educate yourself and become a better person. Because when I went to prison, I couldn't read and write. And I never forget, I had to ask a guy how to spell D. Dear, D, I didn't know was it, I was finna send my mother a Mother Day card, I didn't know it was D-E-R, D-E-A-R. Mm. And this guy told me, he didn't know. And it was like several people in the dormitory didn't know, so one guy told me, said, that don't be discouraged. That with the time that you have, you can educate yourself and you can become a better person. So that's what made me start taking education serious because when I was young in school, I didn't take education serious. You think with, that's still common today? Yes. Okay. Uh, how so? How do you, I mean, I, we all have our, our, our reasons why we think that's common today, but from your perspective, uh, what do you see as being that reason? I think that the, the education that's being offered is not depending on uh, suitable for the person's identity. That is nothing that we're taught that want to make us grasp a hold on to that said that, um, like for me, I read Booker T. Washington up from slavery. And that motivated me to catch, catch my bucket while I were to pull myself up by my, books, by my bootstraps. Mm -hmm. So we gotta have something in there that would be motivating us to wanna make us wanna learn. So it's not just teaching you how to read, but encouraging what you read and what you- Yes, yeah. and let us see that reading is life changing. Like we okay. was talking earlier that when I started reading, <clears throat> Just a year ago, I had to read up about diabetes, health issues. So education is important because when you edu educate yourself, you think different, you dress different, you talk different, and you learn to live better. But see, people are not taking education serious, so that, don't, what that means they don't know how to function in society as a decent human being. Uh, you know, I saw a few things out of your book in reference to you witnessing the death of your father um, as a young boy. Uh, yeah. Trauma. Trauma is something that, that I've found myself really trying to get an understanding of so that we can see how do we actually learn from trauma to improve safety in our communities. Um, uh, what did trauma look like for you in your community? Being, I see a lot of people that are being traumatized by the, by the environment because right now we see a lot of youth, they listen to that rap music and they think that that's the gospel. And I tell them all the time, they must distinguish education and entertainment. So if some per, a person, you got a person saying that this is the way that you should live, that's entertainment. But your environment is showing you something different. It's interesting how, so, the, so many of these young people hear these entertainers talking about something, a lifestyle. Uh, these people went to school, these <laughs> entertainers. Yeah. They got educations, mm -hmm. they, they got uh, credentials. They don't share that in their music, but that's how they became successful is by developing skills. Learning, you know, uh, lyrics is, is, is written. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't know how to write, <laughs> you can't do that. Music is, is a skill set. You have to learn those things. Yeah. It's just interesting that you say young folks listen to these people in the entertainment business and, and don't understand that these people are doing this uh, as a means to an end, not necessarily as a lifestyle, just a, a form of entertainment, a form of uh, self-expression. Okay. So, so it'd be interesting, I find it interesting that you say that they listen to these entertainers and don't know that those entertainers are not the people they think they are. No, because like I said, even through listening to music, it have always had a negative message. When the blues singers were singing and cheating in the next room, that wasn't nothing positive, mm -hmm. but that was entertainment. That wasn't education. That wasn't necessarily that yeah. life. That, that wasn't a lifestyle. Same guy that, that was singing here. that yeah. went home to his wife and family. That yeah. was just a show for he put on and he went home to yeah, his normal so, life. Yeah. 
Chris, we're going to uh, take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to take a few uh, moments to kind of look at some of the chapters in your book and try to get you to expound on some of those okay. things that you found to be challenges. We'll be right back. AP program it not only offers you great opportunities in the classroom but also outside like being a member of the AP program I can come into college already being a sophomore in college so I can completely skip one year just by completing all my AP credits and by taking the classes and passing the exams. I would recommend other students to take AP classes because being a member of the program offers so many benefits and helps you decide what you want to do in the future and where you want to go with your life. And we're back. Chris, this is your book here. We're going to pull a few chapters from it. We're going to discuss some things in general about what's yeah. in the book. Uh, I found something very fascinating in the first chapter, and it had to do with uh, dysfunction, family dysfunction. What encouraged you to write that and make that the first chapter in the book? Um, at this particular time, I went deep in the soul search, and I was reflecting on the death of my father. And you were incarcerated at the and time. And I was incarcerated in the Alabama prison system. Mm -hmm. So I thought about how my dad was brutally murdered, and that put in a dysfunctional family, how my mother and father was never married, but not my grandmother wasn't married. And at this particular time, it was like 11 of us living in a three-bedroom house or one-bedroom. So that began the dysfunctional family, but I also compared to the story of Cain and Abel, how jealousy and envious was in their household how it was in our environment, how it was in our community. So how Cain killed Abel, how Joseph's brothers turned against him and sold his birthrights. And I realized why my homeboys testified against me, how people that what they call now are player haters, but the same reason because of jealousy and envy. So, you know, we have two cousins, and me and my friends talk about it all the time. Jealousy and envy was just destroying our community. Yeah, so that's why I tied it to that particular title, Dysfunction of Family. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So you mentioned uh, the dysfunctional family. There's another chapter that, that kind of speaks to the hostile environment. Yeah. Um, you could just found a little bit about what, what, what you meant by that when you were yeah. writing. Um, at this particular time, I think I was like 10 years old, and I was the developing a state of rebellion against my stepfather. Having a person that, how my biological father told me, that never let anyone hit me and get away with it. And how my stepfather used to try to punish me and I would hit him back. And not only was my household a hostile environment, my community was the hostile environment because it was a lot of jealousy and enemies and a lot of mistrust in the community. So that really made me go into a deeper state of rebelliousness. So it's not only what's happening, but how you react to what's happening. Yeah, how I react to it. Because, like I said earlier, because we are simply being misguided, miseducated, and misinformed of a true identity of what a young man should be. And I experienced it. In, in, your, in your understanding of that, your evolution from that way of thinking before to now, uh, what have you concluded to? Like I said, I, I, that we get a lot of this info, information mm -hmm. about what a man is. You know, we can't identify ourselves. You know, I always tell people all the time, man is mine. Being able to make a rational decision and think for yourself. Because like right now, that my community and society still condemn me, try to label me as a 
convicted felon or ex-con. Mm. But I have enough self-respect and much dignity than myself to carry myself different from being succumbing to the negative labels that they You're not attach to me. By yes. the label that's on so and I tell them all the time, I don't care what people think about me. I just don't allow people to think for me. Absolutely. I, I have a saying um, that is not my personal saying, but one that I've taken um, um, to be my own in some sense. And that is you are a male by birth. You are a man by choice. Yeah. Um, uh, and I believe that's true because, again, it's, um, when you're born, you're born a male, uh, does not necessarily mean that you um, elevate the manhood. Manhood is something entirely different, as is womanhood. Uh, but for males especially, because we see the news all the time, it's national news, you name it, we see uh, all this carnage. Uh, that this devastation of life that yields this ripple effect of trauma that everyone experiences. And it sounds like you experienced some of that same and when you identify the dysfunctional family and yeah. the fact of losing your dad uh, for a child, um, that's a traumatizing event for anyone, in fact. That's a traumatizing yeah. event. But for a child, oftentimes people ignore that children um, don't, are not affected by some of these things. They think that, oh, they'll forget about it, but they don't forget about it, and it manifests itself later in their education and in, in their social behavior with other people. Would you agree with that? Yes. So when you were, you mentioned being a 10-year-old and resisting the, the influence of the adult man in your life, uh, and, and and then you talked about what you saw when you were a young child and saw your dad. Well, I, I guess I want to reflect on what you said when you say you saw your dad die. Mm -hmm. it, it left you angry. Yeah, it sounds like. And and that anger influenced a lot of decisions. It sounds like. Absolutely, because I realized that one of my friends, me, was working out at the gym, and he was telling me, he said, "Man." You know, everybody called me Champ. He said, "Champ, I remember when you was in school that you would come to school and explode." And he was telling me that he said that um, you had a lot of misdire misdirected anger within yourself. And I said, how did you know that? And me and him had a conversation because he had witnessed me and he watched my he watched you from the outside. Yeah, from the outside. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me how proud he is of me today. Mm -hmm. And he said that how you can relate. So I tell him, he said, how are you so affected with young people today? I said, because I feel their pain and their frustration. So I don't have a problem going up to a young brother at the gas station and give them doubt. Because mm -hmm. they mean mug and they acting and pretending hard, but on the inside, that's not them. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you felt anger early on. Yeah, because like Curtis was saying, that mm -hmm. I was brutalized and traumatized by my environment. How did you overcome it, that anger? Through education, through reading. That's no what, lie. That's what took you there. Reading changed my life. Yes. Because it was like that when I studied psychology or sociology, mm -hmm. I seen what I needed at a young age. Counseling was, should have been offered, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it never wasn't. So, and that's where the systemic effect of institutional racism come in at because in our neighborhood, we don't get the full resources that we need to pull our people up from terrible situations. But despite everything, you seem to yeah. have found the resource within yourself to navigate it. Absolutely. And that's, the, that's one of the things that, that can be a takeaway. It's not what others do. It's the reaction that you choose to take. How you respond to the situation. How you react to it. How you, how you yeah. react to the, to the things that happen. Because things are going to happen in life. Yeah. It's going to be what you do about it. But do you have the, the answer from within? Mm -hmm. So as the more information that you gather, better your equip you are to respond to those situations. So your experiences and the change that you had, is that, does that have a lot to do with the choice you made to try to be involved with young people? Because you've done a yeah. lot of things with, with young people and at-risk at -risk people since you've been uh, able to make your own self-determination. Your choices have been to try to influence people. Because I believe that the good I do in life outweighs the bad. So I want to make an impact. I don't want to be known as a troublemaker.
for the rest of my life. I don't want to be, I don't want to leave this earth as a high school dropout. So I made a positive transformation that I want to influence other people that it can be done. So regardless, I quit school at 15, but I'm not going to conduct myself like I quit school at 15. Well, Chris, we're going to continue to have this conversation. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and we're going to um, touch on a few more topics in your book. Okay. Uh, and we'll be right back. As a student in the Mobile County Public Schools, there are a few things I've come to expect. One is a quality education, and the other is a quality lunch. Not only are our school meals well balanced, meeting all federal nutritional standards, but they also have less fat, fewer calories, and they taste really good. Oh, and I forgot to mention, our school lunches contain whole wheat, grains, fruits, and vegetables to give me the energy and brain power to get me through the day. Do you have what it takes to be an Envision graduate? We are pioneering students to be all they can be from 6th grade all the way to 12th grade. I definitely would recommend Envision to other students who feel the way I feel. They really work with you and they've gotten tutors and you have online teachers to talk to. It starts right here. It starts right now. Envision Virtual Academy. Enroll today. Back, we're going to talk about in, in your book Chris, about the chapter in chapter five, I quit, and how I quit ties into incarceration. So, okay. uh, talking offline a little bit, you were just sharing how how um, how what that looked like for you. So, if you don't mind sharing that again, at that particular time, I quit that I was feeling hopeless, useless, and unworthy because me and my stepfather had got into a fight and I had to got kicked out the house. Mm -hmm. So, my grandmother always had deep love for me, so I started living with my grandmother. But in that particular area, I was living in Snug Harbor, and I seen a lot of people that were strung out on drugs. I seen prostitution, I seen death mm -hmm. on a constant basis, so that I went into a deep form of withdrawal. So I didn't want a part of the street life anymore. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be that person that I seen standing on the corner that was begging for change. Mm -hmm. So I tried to go back to school, but I had already developed a habit of hustling. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to go to school to get a GED, but it was hard because I was making five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars a day. So you weren't truly committed to that. No, I wasn't committed to school. Yeah. So that what led to my incarceration. So even though you know I was straddling the fence, mm -hmm. I wanted to do better, but my environment wouldn't allow because my environment had a stronger pull on me. So that what led to my incarceration. So took. Young person right now, and there we got them out there just contemplating the yeah. I quit moment in their life. Mm -hmm. And they got to think about if I quit, what's that going to do? Death, early death, sorry to say, early death, institution, or uh, drug habit. Uh, that's what I quit has yes, waiting because, for you. Because right now, you, can, you can't even must fry french fries at McDonald's without the education. You can't get a job. And so if you don't have a resume where technology and people are highly skilled applying for a job, the chances are against you. The odds are stacked against you. Oh, so you're going back to education is the key to everything. Yeah. Education unlocks the doors. I got to promote it. Yeah. I got to promote yeah. it. Well, you know, and, and I'll say this from your perspective, when you go through Mobile and any other city you visit, um, uh, do you see? You know, do you see Chris Napiers? Do you see a former champ, uh, someone who you used to be uh, uh, walking around? Uh, and when you do, uh, what thoughts go through your head when you see that young person who, who's, who's acting the way that you used to be? It's a sense of shameless mm -hmm. because I know I perpetuated that 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. I, create, I fostered an environment for that person who want to idolize somebody who live in the street life. But I also try to reach out to them and have a conversation, let them know that the consequences of their lifestyle. Right. That you know, even that just a few weeks ago, I was at UPS and I seen a brother, he came in there and he was spending like some ooh wee, like he had just came from Jamaica. <laughs> and I told him, I said, man, you know what? What is an undercover officer? I said, come on, let me step outside, let me talk to you. I said, and I told him how he smelled. 
And I said, man, what if the FBI was in there? Mm -hmm. You know where you're going? And he got in his car and left. Mm -hmm. So that even that, that, I think that I did a good deed because the way that he was smelling. At least you planted a seed yeah, in I his mind. Seat. Yeah, because everybody was frowning up when he came through the door. And did he, uh, did he see it? You saw it. Did yeah, he see it? but he didn't see it. But so every night, like Hugh Curtis was saying, every night that I watch the news, I see myself all over again. And I ask myself, what can I do to make a difference in somebody's life? But the next person will end up on the news. As I, as I sit here and as we talk, I just had this thought uh, penetrate my mind. Your, your nickname, Champ. Yeah. Who gave you that name? My father. And not only is, I'm glad you brought that up. Not only Champ is my nickname, Champ is my altered ego. Okay. Because like everybody wants a Superman, but I had to create mine. So Champ is like my altered ego and my altered hero. Cause you so cause, cause all of the, the, the difficult things that happened in your life, yeah. and you said there was a lot of them. People don't know you as Chris Loser. They yeah. know you as Chris Champ. Yeah, Napier. Cause I'm destined to win. Like I tell people, it ain't over until I win. So just the attitude. Yeah. And, and attitude is everything. You got to eat like a champion, think like a champion, walk like a champion. You got to sleep like one. You got to fight like one. You got to exercise like one. Even in every aspect of my life, I got to think like a champion. And who's got to determine that for you? Self. Chris, as we wrap up, we have about 30, 30 seconds for you to, uh, to give us some final words. Uh, what would you say to a younger Chris Napier today? Don't be deceived about what you're seeing in your immediate environment. Pull yourself up from that. That even though that you may be dealing with some adverse situations, some challenges, that it can be better. It's going to be better. Because like growing up in poverty, spending time in prison, none of that didn't define me. So as I push forward to educate the community on gun violence, high school dropout, drug use and mass incarceration, I must tell them the way that they need to redefine their life and their circumstances mm -hmm. is by education. Well, I appreciate you sharing that information with us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's so much that needs to be done, needs to be yeah. said. I, I applaud you for having the courage to stop and, and, and share wisdom with someone who may not know that, that they smell like marijuana. Yeah. Uh, but I will just say this. Thank you for spending time with us today talking about your life experiences uh, and your book. Uh, uh, this has been Safe Schools. Thank you. And Andy? Are you sharing, sharing your truth is important, and we thank you for doing so. Thank you for being on Safe Schools today. It's my pleasure.